big topics, big ideas, and practical policy solutions. This is Leaders on the Frontier with your host, David Lees. Did you know that affordable energy, specifically fossil fuels, is foundational to our way of life as Canadians? Well, it is. When you think of it, from the gas pump to the grocery store, everything is really ultimately interrelated to the cost of energy, specifically fossil fuels, oil, natural gas, to be specific. So we want to talk today about the state of of energy and fossil fuels in Canada and around the world. We want to look at, frankly, the war that is against fossil fuels uh, today. And with me here today to talk about this incredibly important topic is our guest, Mr. Uh, Gwen Morgan, who is the former CEO of Encana. Gwen Morgan devoted three decades to building North America's leading Encana Corporation into Canada's largest energy company. It's really a remarkable story. And Gwyn has served as a director for many global corporations, including the London-based uh, Hong Kong uh, Bank, the world's largest global bank. He's also been recognized as Canada's leading CEO of the year. And uh, so it's really quite an honor to have you, Gwyn, join us. So a warm welcome to you. Thank you. Good to be here. So, Gwen, I um, am just uh, very excited about our far-reaching discussion. We're going to talk a lot about uh, energy. So I do want to go through, through some really basic questions. And it's, uh, I, I think your background is really quite intriguing. Where did you grow up and how did you get involved in the energy industry? Well, a bit serendipity. I grew up uh, on, a, on a hard scrabble farm uh, feeding the cows and and uh, pigs in the morning before I went to school. Um, but I've always been interested in, in technology and, and uh, my father had a little bit of a road construction business and he dealt with some engineers and he said to me one day, you know, he said, you're really good at math. You seem to like sciences, you're a quick, quick study. Why don't you be an engineer? <laughs> and so I managed to scrape enough money with a little bit of help from then to get myself through engineering school. And, and uh, when I graduated, um, I, this is sort of a little bit of an, uh, an aside, but my plan actually was to, to uh, take an engineering degree and then take a medical degree and become a biomedical engineer and, and deserve, deserve, you know, thing, things like uh, uh, all kinds of diagnostic stuff. But I ran out of money and I went into oil and gas industry. So here I okay. am. <laughs> <laughs> so when you got into the industry, um, what were the key challenges that you faced then as an industry in Canada? Well, it was a lot different then. Uh, people were uh, all, all believed that, that Canada had a responsibility and Alberta and, and the West had a responsibility to supply the energy we, we all needed. Uh, there was never any other uh, mindset, really. And so it was all a question of uh, how we could do it in a way that was responsible and careful and protect the environment and so on. But it was a, the big job was to get that get the job done, and um, that was uh, you know it was a whole mindset at that time. So tell us a little bit more about Encana. I know it's a legendary company; it's amazing. But where did that really come from? What's the 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 mini story about that uh, legendary company? Well, we started uh, what we became, what was originally our Alberta Energy Company. It was something we, we kind of had a little bit of help from the Alberta government because they agreed to buy half the shares of a new a new IPO that would develop energy, uh, oil and gas inside the province. At that time, most, almost every all of the uh, significant oil and gas companies were foreign controlled, mostly from the U.S. So the idea was to create a homegrown one. And... Uh, so we started off um, peddling our shares around the province. I was around uh, as a young engineer going to banks and so on in my hometown and all the way across the province to try and get them to buy our shares. And we grew that company. And, and by the time uh, uh, we reached around the, uh, the millennium, uh, we'd become the largest, uh, two, one of the two largest uh, energy companies in Canada with quite a few operations, not only in Canada, but in the U.S. and other parts of the world. Uh, then I had an opportunity to emerge with the other large one, which is the legacy of the of the Pan-Canadian Petroleum, was the legacy of the uh, 
railway company, CP, and that created then what was then the largest, uh, in, what we call independent, that's non-controlled by the big majors, oil and gas company in North America. Then uh, we went to so when you look at, um, Gwen, the story about Encana, um, and I know this isn't um, like a, a, a business show per se, but when you look at the values that were foundational to building in Canada, what, how would you summarize those values? That's a really good question. Um, values have been a big part of my, my whole philosophy of business and personal life. And so we, we wanted to create a company and uh, based upon those kinds of values and everybody in the company uh, we made sure they knew it, that that, that, they, that we were all about pro suitable values and honesty and, and hard work and dedication and, and, and excellence. Um, and, and, you know, it was interesting because we became a reputation for, for a, not only an ethical company, but a, a great place to work. Mm -hmm. And when that happens, it doesn't matter what business you're in. Uh, you can just about hire anybody from anybody else. And it was that uh, that gave us that opportunity. We could we could pretty much hire who we wanted in the very best, highly technical areas. And so, um, you know, that was so foundational to us. No, it, it's a very exciting story. I do have full disclosure. I was a, um, a proud uh, shareholder of Encana over the years. And, and it was interesting. It just struck me as one of these exciting stories. And there's so many of them across our great country of Canada really building a nation and it's a uh, part of that story so at what point did you realize wow we are on and i know this is sometimes an overworked phrase but a kind of a world-class stage as a company as your capitalization was at uh at really stratospheric heights really and uh, the kind of technology that you had it was really uh, and canna is is truly uh was a force to be reckoned with yeah, we were certainly in Canada and even in the U.S. and elsewhere. But, you know, interesting enough, I live in B.C. now and live on the island where I'm retired. But but the, the whole British Columbia gas play, the big one, the big gas play in the Northeast was in Canada's discovery and the Canada's technology. Mm -hmm. uh, but looking at it broad, more broadly, um, you know, we, 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 you know, you have to have a combination of good management, uh, uh, good skills, and good a little bit of good luck along the way. Uh, but when I retired and uh, decided to step down from the company in, in, the, in, in, in basically 30 years from, my, well, from when we started the original company in a few days from my 60th birthday, we had reached uh, $60 billion U.S. market cap. To start with, a few shares we were selling around the province, <laughs> so yeah. it worked out all right. No, it's amazing, and all the people employed, and and frankly, the the service of that energy to Canadians and North Americans and beyond. So, on that note, I want to ask you, as a as a lay person here, why is energy, um, specifically fossil fuels, so important to our day to day lives? Is there a way to kind of answer that that pointed question well you know it's interesting when you think about the history of fossil fuels i mean the the industrial revolution the one that created uh, all of the, basically all of the advances in the in the 8, 19th century uh were based upon coal and mostly of that in 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 uh, england all the great machines everything mm -hmm. else was coal based um, and but interestingly enough, then the only, the only place that we could get liquid fuels was from the at that time was from the uh, the whaling industry. And it was uh, most people don't understand that that uh, the whaling industry stopped when oils was discovered in Pennsylvania. Yeah, the first, amazing. The first liquid fuels became available that we didn't need whales. So first thing that fossil fuels did was save the whales. <laughs> I guess that's a bit a bit of an off you know, kind mm -hmm. of a diversion, but but anyway, that that's so so. But the, but ever since then, it's been clear. Then we went nuts. We had liquid fuels, uh, and then eventually natural natural gas. Um, there, was, there was sort of a hierarchy of 
fuels and the most uh, today the most ones with the highest emissions of course of coal um, oil is is number two and natural gas is is by far the number three in terms of that but they're all important and they all have their own role and they all they all can't do the same thing so uh, i guess you could say that oil and, and natural gas could do everything that coal could but but uh but coal and natural gas are, have different roles. But but to be clear, this form of energy, as part part of the evolution of of frankly the world, has enabled us to move forward in terms of our standard of living and our quality of life. Because everything, and I mean everything, including solar panels and windmills, are all based on on this incredible industry. Is that right? Well, yeah, I'll, 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 I'll give a two-part answer to that. One is that the, the, the reality is and has been ever since, uh, I, I always look at things, you know, what the physics is, mm. what mm -hmm. the emotions are. Uh, the emotions for people who are really dedicated to getting rid of fossil fuels are not technically or f physically physics-based they're just working towards a, a some sort of a, a dream that's impossible. Sorry, can because, you repeat that again? You're saying that the idea to get rid of fossil fuels isn't based on any physics, dare I say, science. Is that what you're no, saying? It, it, it isn't, because the reality is we all know, I mean, Canadians know this more than anyone else. And of course, people, especially after the winter in the United States, the, them too, I guess. Um, but the reality is that, that um, if you're in, in Manitoba in the winter or any other part of the country, I guess, uh, you don't get a hell of a lot of sunlight. <laughs> right. And it's damn cold. Yes. So it is if you cold. a lot of sunlight, you couldn't possibly heat your house because it's not going to generate enough. And the same thing goes with, uh, uh, with you know, the, the uh, uh, other form of energy, uh, uh, wind. So it, it's those two things... Uh, are demonstrably and technically uh, clearly take more energy to produce it, to, in terms of even to build these solar panels and all that and put, putting these windmills up than you ever get back for them and you don't get it back when you really need it anyway. So okay. the reality is that, that the fossil fuels are the only thing that we can rely on for our way of life. Okay, so there's a, there's a number of things to kind of look at here, but... When you're you're do you care about the environment to be to be blunt? <laughs> yes, in fact, I've always considered myself an environmentalist. I guess I've probably hiked every every uh, trail in the Rocky Mountains for years with the backpack on, and I'm very I'm a very environmentally oriented guy. Okay, so some of this conversation is sometimes seen through kind of a black and white lens, like very yeah. simplistic, but. Fossil fuels is is really important, and there's no perfect energy source. You'd, you'd say that, right? Like, there's always pros and cons that you have to take into account. But in case of fossil fuels, there's incredible advantages that we can manage. Is that basically what you'd say? Well, I wouldn't say just the advantages. They're they're ex as existential. You can't do without them. Period. We have no other period. way these days of of delivering uh, what liquids fuels can deliver to our way of life and no other way of delivering what natural gas can, can deliver to it. We don't have any alternatives. Yeah. There never has been. And so, um, as I pointed out in looking a bit of a history of, the, of energy supply in the world of different types, we just don't have anything else. And, and our whole way of life, and not only in the West and in, in the developed countries, but the undeveloped countries, uh, their biggest problem isn't, you know, is they don't have enough fuel right and and um so the only countries that have a standard of living that we consider to be anywhere near acceptable are the ones that are able to access fossil fuels okay so why is it that there is and we could go through this for quite some time a whole host of policies both in canada and around the world <clears throat> that are systematically taking a war on this industry they're trying to shut it down and in fact uh you have in canada the res uh, revelations we'll talk about that a little bit in a moment but the so-called just transition moving systematically away from quote oil and gas industry to something else like you talk about layoffs of hundreds of thousands of 
of, um, of workers in, in every industry that's related to this. So why are we undertaking this war? Well, you know, this is a very Canadian thing you're talking about because um, while there even, you know, let me back up a bit on that. For, let me come back to that a little bit later. I think, I think that the, uh, the big revelation that's, that started with the Ukrainian war um, and is now continuing in, in, in various other ways is that, you know, Germany demonstrated that you couldn't get by with, with wind and solar power. They shut down mm -hmm. zero emission nuclear plants. And that wasn't because of emissions. That was because of a, a sort of an environmental religion about, you know, somehow we don't want any, for years it's been, we don't want any uh, emissions from fossil fuels, but we also want to shut down the only source, the only source of zero emission, highly reliable energy. So when you try to figure that out, it, it, it leads you to try to understand the rest of it. The rest of it is that there's the realistic, there's no, the realism and, and the and the facts and the physics don't matter. You know, it, it's, uh, I'm, I'm, by the way, I'm not, I'm not anti-religious, but I, I use that term. Yes, so right. You believe in something, um, you know, the old thing is, I remember the, the, the great uh, Christmas um, story about uh, it, the train goes to the Arctic and Tom Hanks was great at it. But, but at, the, at the very end of it, the Polar Express, it was called, at the very, very end, a little kid gets off the train and he goes back. He, this is like his dream. He's going back to his house and climbing in the window. Apparent. And, and um, at the very end, it, it said, you can only, all you really have to do, anything is possible if you only believe. And so a lot of the people seem to be like that little kid, you know, mm. it's all possible if we only believe, even yeah. though in the real world, in the daylight, when you're out of bed, it's not. Wow. So there's almost this um, bizarre disconnect between people that are advocating with, I, I presume, good intentions, trying to protect the environment. We, we care deeply about it, but how do we also ground our feet uh, on the reality that we are dependent on fossil fuels? And so how do we, how do we um, move forward in our society and, and uh, quite frankly, do that industry well? And, and it, because in Canada, you'd have to say that the Canadian fossil fuel industry is really quite extraordinary. Um, I figured this out, I believe, through my conversations with people actually in other countries, believe it or not, where they would comment regularly on how advanced our industry is. And I, I suspect a lot of Canadians aren't aware of that. Would you say that's a fair comment? Well, you know, when, you, when you're when you against something, it doesn't matter how advanced it is <laughs> or how good it is. But, you know, I think that, that I want to come back to Canada a little later because that's, of course, what we want to focus on. But, but I guess what I'm what I'm getting wanted to get to is that that the, the this whole result of the Ukrainian war uh, it, it's it wasn't that the war itself caused this, but it, it wasn't long afterwards when it became evident when we when we needed more oil than because of reduction of of supplies from, from Russia. For, for, because of sanctions, um, we discovered that there wasn't enough. And so their oil price rocketed because it was so much on a knife edge. And so it turns out that uh, people didn't realize that while we're doing all this stuff about cutting back on fossil fuels and oil, each year the world demand for oil has been going up by, by a million to two million barrels a day. And it's still Sorry. going up. Can you and repeat the that? So is, the demand for this product is high, more higher than like record levels. Is that what you're saying? Yeah, and it's going it, to, well, it is, it is but the, the International Energy Agency, who is pretty neutral on this stuff, say it's going to keep going up. They say we're going to be, keep adding another million barrels a day of demand continuously for the next several years. And so, so where's a lot so, of that so, demand coming from, Glenn? Well, so here's the point. Uh, what, 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 but but when when the uh, 
when we started to put sanctions around Russia and reduce their oil supply, we discovered that there wasn't enough oil without their oil. So in other words, Russia was, has become the swing producer for oil supply in the world. And that's a revelation that most people didn't have any clue about, including myself, by the way. So, so now we have, the uh, reality is that we need Russian oil. And, and that's OPEC is already wide open. They're looking at doing some more drilling and trying, but they, were, but they, had, they just were wide open. So here we had a situation where, um, and have a situation where Putin controls is the swing. They're, they're one of the major, the major members of what's called OPEC plus, which is original OPEC plus a few others. And they, they have, uh, have become, become the swing producer. In other words, if they, and, and therefore uh, they control the world oil price. And then here we had, and I'll just carry on with this for a bit because it's a bit of a, these are connected items. Um, here we have China, uh, which is saying that they're going to, they're the, by far, by far, by far the highest emitting emissions country in the world. President Z says, "Oh well, you know we're gonna we're gonna cut back and and we're gonna reduce our our coal demand and 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 we're gonna be on the on that you know we go to the COP meetings we're gonna be really cutting back and, and meanwhile he's got two hundred coal plants coal fired plants under construction today, two hundred coal two hundred and they're already producing like sixty to seventy percent of world emissions, so." Um, this is a this is a game of bait and switch with these guys. So what we then have here's a situation. Let me go further to this. Um, picture this now. You got China, who's a meeting every 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 item they produce is much more in intensive in energy intensive emissions intensive than in North America or Europe, the developed countries much more. And yet. Uh, what are we doing? We're 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 putting we're putting uh, both in Canada and elsewhere we're putting taxes on, on on our emissions on our on our use of fossil fuels. We're uh, uh, having uh, you know besides uh, you know the, the direct carbon taxes, we're we're implementing other things that make it awfully difficult to uh, to to basically manufacture anything here. In fact, it's gotten to the point where virtually none of our manufacturers or almost none can compete with what's being produced by, by Z's China. So here we are uh, reducing, basically killing our, our industries that consume fossil fuels here in a much more efficient and less emissions intensive way and handing the market to for that so those same manufactured goods to China. So here's here's the sort of summary of this theme I'm on right now, and I'll move on to other whatever else you get to. That who could have ever believed that the that the whole whole attempt to bring the West off fossil fuels has resulted in the following: it resulted in one despot being in control of the oil market, and another despot being in charge of virtually all our manufactured goods, and killing our own ability. And our jobs to manufacture here. Yeah. That's that's the legacy of the green movement. And it's it's it's. It, I'm not saying we, you know, I'm not happy about this, obviously. Mm -hmm. But it's it's a reality that people don't seem to want to face. That we've we've empowered Putin and Z, two despots, to be dependent on them and killing our jobs and 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 our industry industry here. Wow. So the irony is that. The green movement, uh, regardless of whether you think they have good intentions or not, has um, ended up pursuing uh, the death of a of a, a fossil fuel industry that's critical to our way of life. Um, and right now, we don't have a, a frankly a viable alternative, despite what Greta Thunberg might say. But we we've what you're saying, Gwen, is that you've we've empowered. Um, really uh, foreign adversaries, namely China and uh, Russia. 
and we can't manufacture as many things here because we're doing that. Is that right? Well, not only have we done that, but in the case of China, uh, what, what every, everything we buy from them, because we can't afford to produce it here, has probably two to three times as much emissions intensity mm -hmm. as the same product if it were manufactured at home. So, but that's reality, and, and, and we've created that. The green movement and all of this stuff. And when I write columns about, you know, about this and they all say I'm a, the old oil and gas guy and they don't care about anything else. I care about everything else. Mm -hmm. But I also care about facts and information. Exactly. And, and we've got China empowered to have us by the short hairs, if I could put it that way. And and we're buying stuff because we can't do it at home that produces a hell of a lot more energy and we're shutting our own manufacturers down who could do it in much more efficiently and more environmentally sensitive. Yeah. That's so, reality. So just to, to illustrate that reality a little bit more, is it correct that um, China and uh, dare I say um, India, let alone Russia, I believe, they're not signatories to all these quote ambitious uh, environmental agreements that you see all these people flying into with their private jets to Scotland and, and other locations, uh, they're not signatures to uh, to those agreements, are they, Gwen? No, no. China goes China goes to COP twenty six. Russia goes to COP twenty six, COP twenty seven. All the COP meetings, they all make. I mean, they go there and they say that's what I said earlier. Z went to sent his guys there and there was people there and they made great promises and how they're going to cut everything back. But, they but they're home. not signed on to the agreement. They fly home and start building more power, more coal-fired plants. So they were there. <laughs> okay. But it was so, interesting in the last one of the last COP meetings, um, they they had a resolution that this is the conference of the parties, by the way, uh, for the for, for global warming. But they had uh, one of one of their uh, uh, people came there and said, well. You know, we, we we're going to do all this, but then they presented a resolution to phase out fossil fuels over the next twenty years, and China wouldn't sign it, so so they, they couldn't pass it. So, it, but anyway, it's it's they go, but it's all it's all uh, window dressing. Okay, so I do want to recap a little bit then incisively the state of Canadian energy. So, if we had to summarize it up. The energy seen they, well because the demand for fossil fuels is so high and, and getting higher every year. How would you describe the state of Canadian energy in a nutshell now? Well, we have the third largest, uh, well, the third largest oil reserves in the world. We have incredible, incredibly large um, falling resources of natural gas, and our natural gas, by the way, is is. Uh, is produced in such a environmentally sensitive, clean way, and uh, we, we, but we can't get we're just like oil. We can't get oil on a pipeline built because every time we uh, try, the, the U.S. Uh, the federal government sort of makes sure it doesn't happen one way or another. And, and uh, we we have such arduous uh, regulations and procedures for anything like building pipeline, a gas pipeline to tide water and a building a LNG plant that, that you're trying to get it out of the country. The, the one we have right now started 20, 15 years ago, and we're just getting finished with it right now. So now which one is that the uh, Trans Mountain but, project? Yeah, that's the Canada, uh, LNG Canada, which has got uh, uh, mostly a shell and others in it. Mm -hmm. So, so we've, we've, I mean, there was 19 other projects, by the way, but they all couldn't make it because of procedures. Combination. So you said, well, let's just hold on for a sec. We want to bury that headline. 19 projects were yeah. under consideration. I think people would be shocked to hear that. Yeah, there 19, were 19 pipeline they, 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 projects to the, the West Coast? But they never made it because they, the people just gave up because of the procedures. We couldn't, there was a comedy, the, the, the regulatory procedures, uh, the bureaucracy, the sort of general, sort of in the background, anti-fossil fuel. Uh, there was a, a combination of that, and, and of course the Aboriginal, or in some cases Aboriginal, 
objections and the whole whole combination of things is a sort of a toxic soup for getting anything done in this country. Okay, so part of the reality is that the demand for fossil fuels has never been higher, it continues to climb, and yet Canada can't seem to get things done because of the regulatory state of affairs. And, yeah, uh, and the, you know, interesting uh, natural gas is, is so it, it, what's really interesting about natural gas is that there, if, if we were, if, if there were, if the natural gas market in the world was fully supplied with all in all its need, um, and it, it would actually, in, in a lot of ways, we'd, able, we'd be able to replace uh, liquid fuels. And there's nothing more, no more, nothing more we can do realistically instead of these sort of pipe dreams that, that people have uh, than to increase the use of natural gas. Wow. Uh, I mean, I, I t- tell people a story about uh, when we started our company way back in 75 and I had these, uh, we we're doing all these wells and they were small production, but, but uh, continue, they were, had good sustainability. Um, and uh, my, uh, the trucks we, we had, the field trucks, all the field operators would drive around the field and service these wells, um, ran on natural gas in 1976. Wow. And all they had to do, they, had, they also had uh, uh, gasoline tanks, of course. And when the pressure in the, in the gas tank went down, they just turned over a switch in the, inside the cab and the engine kept running on, 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 on gasoline. So the, the, the idea of, of gas-fueled, natural gas-fueled automobiles goes back. Uh, we were doing it in 1976. Isn't that great history? Because, because of those, the, the internal combustion engines don't care which it is, mm-hmm. uh, gasoline cars. And so this is a huge uh, opportunity to rather than trying to spend money on battery cars and and all the toxic uh, mining and stuff associated with it and the cost, uh, we could we could make a lot of um, uh, things by, of course, easing the shortage of, of of oil and and increasing the demand for natural gas in the cleanest fuel oh. areas. So, if you were to look at um, the state of Canada's energy then, and all these policies that are designed to undermine it and put people to, to uh, you know, frankly, put them uh, to be unemployed. Um, what, how is the industry responding? Like, what's going on now as, uh, as you look at the field? How is the industry responding in Canada to all this, frankly, war that it's experiencing? Well, you know, what's really interesting about <clears throat> this whole situation is that it's unique to Canada. Nobody else has got the environmental extremism that the Trudeau government has. Nobody, no other country. The most of them have realized, including Europe, huh. which were on a, a previously different page, have realized that we need to have fossil fuels. And Sorry, need Canada to- is a loner on this front? Like we're Absolutely. all we're, this we're the, self-inflicted pain? We're the, we're the only ones that are have, have, have not got haven't realized that we can't get by without fossil fuels. Uh, Europe was the last one to realize that, but they got a huge, very difficult lesson. And so, and and the U.S., uh, you know, they have they have their emissions controls, but the natural gas production and exports in the U.S. has skyrocketed because there's a market there. Because it's and, never uh, been higher, right? Again, yeah, it's never been higher. higher. So, so the, the the only country that is. Uh, philosophically or whatever you want to use the term opposed and not being realistic about the future of, of, of mm. fuels and the, and the impossibility of wind and solar supplying everything, which is ironic because one of the coldest countries in the world um, is, is the uh, Trudeau government. So it's, it's a unique thing, um, but they're, it's like, um, it's like they just don't hear. It, it doesn't matter. We're, we are going to, do, you know, you talked about this earlier, but we're going to take oil and gas industry people and retrain them. Mm-hmm. Retrain them. That's the just, the just transition. Yeah. But you know what that sounds like? It sounds like something you would have expected at a communist China under Z. Okay. 
wow. Right. I mean, really, I'm not being exaggerating. When you tell people who are producing something that they're good at it and it's their career and it's their job and it's their future and this whole mm-hmm. world. Well, their families. They're going to stop you from doing that. Mm-hmm. One of the, one, one of the things that came out of the truth was, you know, was something to, you know, there's lots of good janitorial jobs. And, and, and it's, it's so astounding that this could be happening in our country. And what's even more astounding is that Canadians don't seem to understand it. This wow. just transition. You know, if we went to Ontario until we're going to have a just transition for the auto industry, mm-hmm. we're going to take everybody that engineers and, and designs and produces the auto, auto cars and retrain you. We're going to, what would happen? Well, you know what would happen. Mm-hmm. But it's happening today. At least it's been proposed. Okay, so I, 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 I do have a, a question I'd like to test with you then on that front, Gwen, and that that is that if you go back to the reality, again, we're trying to understand the reality of energy and its importance to Canadians and, and the world. If fossil fuels are foundational to everything, that means that these policies not only impact the oil and gas industry directly, it impacts every other industry. I think of industries such as agriculture, forestry, mining, and ultimately manufacturing. I mean, this is everything is on the table then. Is that not the reality that maybe Canadians don't understand then and how that's going to impact people? That's going to put out millions to be unemployed. Ultimately, that's where we're going. Is it not, Gwen? Well, it, it would, uh, but uh, that's that's if, if this government succeeds it. But I think that the interesting thing is that it's it's only a Canadian reality. No other country. Yeah, we're doing this to so, ourselves, right? Yeah, is that what you're it, it's no other country even coming close to, to making such a mess of things. And and so um, it, it's it's what, 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 there's a there's a certain mindset that just isn't realistic that's in some sort of fairyland, mm-hmm. but it's all tied up with the Trudeau government. It is, you know, and his, 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 his environmental minister who scaled the uh, CN Tower with us, the Greenpeace right. sign. So we're, we're, these are the kind of people we have. They're not realistic. They're not mm-hmm. looking, they don't understand physics. They don't understand anything about yeah. this, but it's the only country. And so, um, that's a astounding thing. I mean, the, the good news about all this is that, you know, um, uh, Danielle Smith is not going to put up with this crap. Mm-hmm. Uh, neither mm-hmm. is Scott Moe and, 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 and so on. I think that, that, that we're going to have even more of a war, but uh, they're, they're, they're certainly not going to try to take people out of, out of the industry, oil and gas industry, who are good at what they do and put their professional lives at it and, quote, ret- remove them and retrain them. Because um, among other things, um, uh, that it, it, the, even if the, if, the, if the Canada rights, uh, rights and freedoms uh, r- r- laws uh, have any impact, then that would be impossible anyway. But besides that, there's political issues. But the problem is that we're, we're wasting all this time and energy and, and, and in, 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 for a country that could be actually helping the world uh, to, to produce uh, fossil fuels in a, in a, in a very uh, in a lower intensity way, in a very responsible way, and panning the market to China and Russia. That's, that's what we're what Trudeau ultimately is doing with his policies besides okay. hurting people here. So if we shift a little bit more to the world stage, then um, we have a lot of the world, frankly, knocking on Canada's door. Uh, we've had a number of international delegations. I remember, uh, I believe it was this summer, we had um, the uh, president of uh, Germany, no less, and then later the Japanese, among others, uh, frankly, asking Canada to come to the table to supply um, well-known Canadian energy. And I believe the response at the time was by the prime minister that there is no business case uh, to export energy. What do you, what, what is your response to that? 
Yeah, we had this technical and economical economic expert called uh, Justin Trudeau say there's no business case when the whole all of the Canadian business knows there is. But that's that's <laughs> it's 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 it, all of this is just bizarre stuff. I mean, uh, you know, it's like when when we when we started to as we, the sanctions started to bite on Russia and the world was looking to Canada to see if they could get more oil and they came over and and then and then Russia. Um, Justin Trudeau was in, I think, in, in Latvia, I think, and the, the reporter said, put, put a mic in his face and said, you know what, how is Canada going to help? Well, he said, uh, we will be there, something like these, are, they may not get the words exactly, we'll be there to help when we're able to, when we're, and to help demonstrate how people can get off fossil fuels. We'll be there to help. And wow. so this is a time when we had people desperate in, in Europe and, and Ukraine and elsewhere, desperate for fuel. And and he's going to help with something that, that's going to have be wind and solar by the year 2040 or whatever. Okay, so, so Gwen, just to be clear, though, when you say Europeans or the rest of the world are desperate, this means people in their homes need to warm their home because it's a cold winter and there's well-documented cases of thousands of elderly people choosing to buy groceries over their heating and then tragically having health difficulties and even dying. This is well-documented. So this is a very real issue between um, hurting people, like their, their lives are at stake. And I don't mean to sound um, overly dramatic here, but that is the reality, is it not? Well, yeah, but Europe has been really lucky in a, in a very kind of a strange way. I mean, obviously the war and everything is terrible, but they've been lucky because they've had an exceptionally warm winter. Mm. Uh, had it been a normal winter, it would have been disastrous. But uh, And people have been very resourceful and, you know, they're out chopping wood and even getting hauling coal from a coal mine in a bucket, you know, they're doing it every day. They, they can, but they've been saved by the by the by the winter, and here's okay. the, here's the irony, you know. There's no business case for supplying LNG, I guess, but but they, but the Qataris have have upped their game in terms of supplying LNG to Germany, mm -hmm. and Germany has built, uh, you know, when you when you have a liquefied uh, gas, you also have to have liquefaction, you know, gasification at the other end, so you add you have to add heat. To basically get it back into gaseous form. So you have to have these these facilities for gasification. In Canada, you know, we were talking about building one in the east of a couple of years ago, and it's still kind of under whatever. Uh, they were, the Germans were able to build a liquefaction plant in 45 days. In 45 days? 45 days. Wow. Uh, and they, it's a, they put it on a, on a big barge and uh, it's a floating one. Uh, we can't even build one in two years. So, but it, it's but they, but their Germans have 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 have, have but then the Qataris stepped up now they, to send their LNG ships. So, uh, you know, we're we're certainly the world is being helped, but certainly not by this part of it. It's, so, it's so we're missing these incredible opportunities to supply the world with, I believe, ethical energy from Canada, not some tin pot dictators from Russia or Venezuela and who knows where else, but instead the Germans and Japanese are knocking on other doors now because we can't, we can't get it done. Is that what's going on? Well, I guess that's right. I mean, I think they, they always were, those other countries are always were key producers of, of, of fossil fuels. But the thing is that, that what, what is really missing in all of this, if you looked at the, at the opportunities for candidates to export their, their oil and gas, create, not only creating jobs in the country, but the the revenue. Mm. And we're talking about billion dollars of billions of dollars of deficit. Canada's economic growth was supposed to be the the lowest in the G in the G20 this year. It's coming year because we have nothing going on, and wow. we're spending more money than we can make. Those projects, those LNG projects, and alone, if they had been, on, if they could get them on stream, would be producing more revenue for the government of Canada and for Canadians than any other 
wow. any other part of the holding company put together. It would be a whole, you know, like it's a whole different range of the economy, standard of living, and and the way Canadians can deal with uh, things like inflation. It's it's truly mind-boggling the opportunities for our country, isn't it? And for the next generation. So so speaking of that, can you help us understand the so-called energy discount when we look at the whole issue of um, bringing energy to tidewater? Why is that important? I know that we basically have, in many cases, really only one um, energy customer, namely the United States. So we we don't get as much money. Is that right? And we pay a price for that. Yeah, I mean, it, 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 I guess the simplest way of looking at it is if I've got something you need, but I'm the only guy that wants it, I'm not, am I going to pay you as much as I have to, as, as I want to? I'm, I'm sorry, as much as, as, as the international price, I'm going to pay you what I think I, I, I can sort of, I'm going, to, I'm going to discount it so that it, it matches up with the, with what I could get elsewhere. And so, so there's this, everything, there's always a discount. I mean, it doesn't matter what you're producing. If, if you're producing uh, something somebody else needs and you can't get it, you can't supply it, they can't move it. And the, 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 the producer of it say, well, there's grain. If we, if we couldn't get grain to Tidewater, the price of grain in Canada would be lower. Exactly. Same, yeah. same thing. So yeah. we're paying, we're not getting as much money for our energy as we should be if we had a more robust functioning market for getting our our energy to to the ocean, right? Well, if we had pipelines, that's the simple thing. And we haven't built exactly. a deep pipeline for years. And, and you yeah. know, and unfortunately, our, our good friends uh, in the U.S. canceled the only one new pipelines we had that was already under construction. And that was the keystone, right? Uh, yeah, a few days after after his election, and he was... Uh, you know, this is another, people make decisions based upon ideology. And that was, uh, his, there was a lot of idea, a lot of people in his cabinet who were sort of in the same page in terms of emissions. And emissions. So if we cut Canadian oil off, we're somehow going to have less emissions. <laughs> it's, 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 so, it's it, how ridiculous is that? That's not going to change the average motorist. It's, uh, it's crazy. So... Is, yeah. it, is it fair to say then, as we look at the world stage, we've looked quite a bit at the Canadian state of energy and how that's also been buffeted and impacted by the uh, international stage. We can clearly see that the more domestic policies driven by concern about the, quote, uh, environment or climate alarmism, as some people call it, is being kind of overridden by geopolitical realities and the need for energy. Is that a fair comment then? Well, there's no question about it. I mean, the reality is the reality. But I think, you know, it's interesting. I, I just want to, I want to mention, David, that uh, how people say, well, okay, what would you do? What would you do? If I wanted to, you wanted to reduce emissions, but also maintain living standards and, and, and prevent shortages. So what I would do, uh, basically... I was at saying, okay, what's going to be the most effective way of reducing emissions? It's not going to be shutting in, uh, reducing Canada's 1.5% of global emissions to 1.1 or 2, which, which, is, 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 which was hard to do anyway. It's going to be, where are we going to make the biggest difference? Exactly. I would say, okay, uh, who's the biggest emitter? We already know who it is. So how can we... And who is that again, Gwen? Just to remind yeah, us. Is that again? Yeah. <laughs> so, so, so we're buying stuff from them, and encouraging, and they're using these very high emissions ways of doing things. So, how can we? So, if we, if we want to change anything, we got to stop. We got to somehow reduce their emissions. And the only way we reduce their emissions is to stop. Is to reduce the amount of stuff we're buying from them. There's no other way. And what are we going to do about Russia? Well, the only way we can do anything about Russia's domination, dominance of the market is to produce more of our own oil. Wow. Well, these are pretty simple things. 
but instead of that, we're attacking ourselves here at home. Yeah. So it's a dysfunctional policy end to end. It's it's self-inflicted pain. And meanwhile, if we developed our fossil fuel industry, we could not only be arguably helping out moving energy, uh, the state of the environment for, because we'd be improving our exports to places like China and India that are, let alone Japan and Germany, who need this, this uh, well-supplied energy. And we should be manufacturing more at home. That's kind of the, it's a profound opportunity for us as we employ more people and raise our standard of living and actually have a hope for our future. Wow, I sound like a commercial, don't I, Gwen? <laughs> <laughs> well, if you, if you make, back on where we started, if you, if you, if you make your decisions based on basic principles, re reality, um, ethical decisions, and analysis, and, and knowledge, rather than just some sort of a very, very reactionary that hands the other guy the advantage you would you have a lot more chance of winning well said so as we look to the future what can we do to encourage people to act like what can we do as canadians as we look at this frankly slow train wreck unfold what can we do to get it back on course like beyond educating ourselves around these facts and reality um as you as you say what can we do well, I've kind of given up on this government because they're they're not they're just no realism there, no reality. Mm. So the only thing that, that that is going to change is a change in government. I'm afraid. So your your thesis would be that the leaders within the Trudeau administration don't understand the reality of what they're doing, um, like. When we look at the just transition plan, and, and I did find the leaked document, um, yeah. it, it refers on page 68, we're looking at at least 3 million plus out of work, out of this quote, just transition. Um, yeah. It is just hard to make this stuff up. It's Well, we, we'd have a civil war in Canada, so, uh, but, 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 but that's how re unrealistic they are and, uh, and how much uncaring they are about the West, frankly. And and so, um, they, they, you know, I'm not going to lose much sleep over that being implemented, but I do believe it just illustrates the problem. When you're in that kind of a mindset, that extreme mindset, these are things, as I said earlier, that are, are only ever heard of in autocratic, despotic governments to take mm -hmm. people and say, OK, I'm, I'm going to take you out of your job and what you've done, your way of life. I'm going to put you where I want you. And become a janitor. Yeah. And it's, nothing against janitors. That's not a democracy. That's not what yeah. Canada stands for. And I hope right. it's not what Canadians stand for. Exactly. Well, look, Gwen Morgan, it's uh, been uh, quite a revelation to have this conversation. You're a, um, a leader within the um, energy business and certainly a business leader in Canada and around the world. We're so grateful that you could join us for this discussion. And thank you for your insights and your courage for speaking up. Well, thank you, David. I have great respect for your, your Frontier Center and, and the, so many, the work you do in so many different ways. You're one of the, the good guys, as far as I know, in this country. Well, thank you so much, uh, Gwen, and all the very best to you and your family. Well, and thank you to all of you who've joined us as that uh, brings to a close our discussion with uh, Gwen Morgan about the state of energy in Canada and the world. We want to uh, welcome your feedback and your comments, and we uh, certainly invite you to continue to be involved in Frontier. Be sure to check out our website at www.fcpp.org and sign up for our newsletter. Uh, and please continue to think about these important issues. And remember, Frontier is nonpartisan. We do not uh, accept any government funding. So your donations are very welcome as it makes our mission possible. So thank you. That's it for today. And remember, without open discussion and debate, you're not thinking and nor are you free. So keep asking good questions and do not be afraid. And on behalf of all of us at Frontier, thank you for joining us. Thank you for watching Leaders on the Frontier. We're a nonpartisan think tank. We explore ideas, policy, and practical solutions that can make a difference in the lives of Canadians. We do not accept any government funding. We work for you. Thank you for supporting Frontier. 
visit fcpp.org to give. While you're there, be sure to check out our latest articles and research. Without open discussion and debate, you're not thinking, nor are you free. Comment below. We'd love for you to join the conversation.